supposed to do. But when I don't have a spot that I have two plates on, I'm There's your first problem. Yeah, I told the guy I didn't need a spot. I need a spot. You need a spot always. Which you're literally just, doing baby weight that won't hurt you. Or just do higher up all weight. Yeah. Or you don't. Know, exactly. Welcome. Does your mouse implementation already do a multi threaded code <laughs> uh, for the extra uh, bonus? It's on the storyboard, <laughs> uh, but we're not quite there. It's not quite there. But the functions can run functions, so that's something. Oh, okay. you can do recursion now. Did you do, did you try recursion? I didn't try it, but what should I do? Maybe uh, factorial or something. You do fib. That's pretty cool. Fibonacci. Something. Please don't encourage him. If he does something, you don't encourage him. <laughs> uh, I'm beginning to think that you should uh, present that in uh, like a research student conference. I think you, you did a lot. I'm curious to see your implementation. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. This is the encouragement part. No, I'm, I'm being serious. Now. Not joking. Pretty cool. You're the first student that actually did try the, these bonus points. that like ever out of all of your teaching or just here? This is the second time that I'm using this mouse programming language. Oh. In the past, uh, the programming language weren't, I think, as cool as this mouse one. They were more like subset of non-language, but very small subsets and didn't have the interpreter. So this mouse is an ongoing project. Yeah. Maybe next semester, I'm not going to even give bonus points for the macro. I'm just going to put it as a requirement, right? OK. So let's do some review before we start. <laughs> so this should work. Uh, I think. Oh, never mind. Let's see. Anyone else? Ah, I got it right. Let's go. Answer is six. Eight. Sorry. No, the answer is eight. Six answered eight. Oh. Uh, so we have. Assume static scoping, we have in main uh, print x. Uh, x is a global variable, right? Define outside any function. So that's why it prints four. Uh, and then we have foo z. So z is an argument for function foo. And so y is the parameter. So the value of y is 3. And then we have x4. So we have uh, many things being done with x and y, but then we call print x. But because it's static scoping, it doesn't matter. Uh, print x is still going to use x global. Okay? That's why we have 4 again. If that was dynamic scoping, that would be a different story, right? 
because whatever x is would be the value printed by print x. Would be 16, right? 16. Okay, you guys uh, are confident and see the difference between static scoping and dynamic scoping. This one has a lot of reading, but basically it's about MATLAB. Did any of you use MATLAB before? So MATLAB in index array start at one. That's what happens when people from engineering and scientific uh, creates programming language, <laughs> not computer science like us. this one. Okay, Leticia. Leticia is not very experienced when she's remote. <laughs> I was able to do it, Leticia. Okay, so the answer is B. That's not correct. The address of the element and index is given by base address plus index times array type size. That will be if the index, uh, the array started at index zero, right? But because it started index one, uh, the formula would be index minus one times, right, the array. Dynamic array, 84%. Construct we talked about before. array that was easy. The last one not true about references.
Okay. Reference can address arbitrary VM location. That's not true. All the other the others are correct. Reference are safer compared to pointers. So that's correct. Reference can be assigned to other reference variables. That's correct. Reference can address objects. That's correct. Okay. All right. How about we give a big applause to Mohammed? Mohammed is back online. We're really happy. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. See you back. Uh, okay, so let's go to the new schedule. Um, let's finish uh, lesson 11. Today we will be starting functional programming. So last time we were discussing semantic analysis. We discussed some uh, typical uh, rules. So we discussed that semantic analysis is, is harder to express, different than syntax. Syntax can be, it's, it's easier to formally specify syntax rules using uh, grammar theory. Uh, there's a formalism behind um, when we specify syntax rules, when we describe uh, productions in a grammar. So there's a well-established way to describe syntax. Semantic is harder because it's more about um, some rules and conditions that you need to satisfy. And sometimes these conditions, they require uh, the semantic analyzer to maintain information about things that uh, are being discovered as the program is being parsed, right? For example, the first time the syntax analyzer perhaps sees a, a variable being declared, that information needs to be saved. Usually we use a data structure called symbol table. That information needs to be saved and will be used later to check semantic rules. Like later, uh, the, your, your program starts to uh, attempt to use that variable. So then the semantic analyzer needs to check, oh, if this is a statically uh, typed language that requires uh, variables to be declared before first use, it needs to check if the variable uh, it was previously declared. If you're assigning a value, you need to check uh, type compatibility. Uh, if a function is being called, uh, you need to make sure that the types are compatible. If you're calling the function, the, uh, the way uh, the function was defined in terms of number of parameters, number or the order of the parameters, uh, so there, there are a lot of things that need to be checked. This can be very complex. Like, for example, uh, functions can have named parameters, right? So checking whether, uh, and sometimes named parameters can have default values, right? Uh, so to check, like, you call the function, but you didn't provide some named parameter, does that name parameter have a default value, right? If not, you need to uh, flag a semantic uh, error, right? So it's much more complex and difficult to describe formally, right? But uh, one uh, common way to do uh, attempt to describe semantic is extending uh, grammars and, and putting attributes uh, specifically uh, that kind of help us to define and check those rules. So this, those are what we call uh, 
attribute grammars. Right? An attribute grammar is basically kind of an extension of a grammar, of a programming language grammar, uh, to allow uh, adding attributes, attach attributes to symbols uh, in our grammar, and use those attributes uh, to describe semantic groups. And this is uh, something that, again, there isn't a formalism, like a, a, a standard on how to define attribute grammars. And this, I, I have to say, this is something that is complex to do. And we're just going to touch, uh, scratch the, the, this topic. Uh, just to illustrate how attribute grammars can be used to describe uh, semantic rules. And we started last time with some examples. Uh, this is a, a typical grammar, very simple, showing how an assignment is defined. Uh, this is a very simple example. And how would you extend that using um, those attributes that I was talking about. Uh, so you put dot, right, in the name of the attribute, and you use that to describe semantic rules. Uh, you may ask, uh, what are those uh, index one, index two? So basically, because we have the var symbol, appearing on the left side and on the right side of this assignment expression here, we need to differentiate the, those two variables somehow when we describe the semantic rule. So the var symbol that is on the left will be referred with this index one, and the one that is on the right side will, refer, will be referred as index two, okay? So the what we want to check is whether the type, right, the attribute type uh, associated with the bar one, the one on the left side of the assignment, matches the type of the bar on the right side of the assignment. How do we get the type of a variable? We do a lookup. So the lookup is a generic function here that the semantic analyzer will use to read the symbol table. Okay, and we'll do that using another attribute, which is the name associated with the variable. So let's say that at some point, uh, you're starting your semantic uh, analysis, and this is the parse tree you have. And in order to check if this assignment uh, is uh, semantic correct, is correct in terms of semantics, uh, the semantic analyzer will perform a lookup on those variables, A and B, and look at the type uh, attributes. Right? This is what's going to happen. Uh, a lookup will give me uh, this variable here. The name is A. I'm going to use the name to do the lookup. And remember, the, the, the programming assignment, don't you guys remember that the parse tree has the, uh, has the label and the value, right? Those are attributes that I was adding in order to help me doing the the uh, interpreter, right? So uh, think about these as just key value pairs added to tree nodes in the programming assignment, in the mouse uh, assignment. So uh, I'm going to add another one called type based on the lookup that I'm going to do using the name of the identifier. I'm going to do a lookup and figure out what's the type of that uh, variable A. And I can do that because when the interpreter sees a declaration of a variable declaration, it will save that information in the symbol table. And then later, 
will do a lookup to get the type of this variable here on the left side of the assignment, and we'll do another lookup to get the type of the variable on the right hand of the assignment. And then after all that information is in the parse tree, uh, the this, this semantic analyzer can check the, those types and see if they are compatible. They're both in, so that's good. Okay. So you guys were concerned whether we're recording? Yeah, today I I think I am recording. Yeah. And I apologize. Last time I think I didn't start recording right away, but I remember today. So this other example is a little bit more complex because we have an expression, right? So on the right hand side, we don't have just a single variable, we have an expression. So we need to evaluate what's the type. Resulting type of the expression. Yeah. So, uh, how, if each of our nodes has all that information, then why do we duplicate that information in the symbol table if we could just get it from the node? Well, because uh, a variable can be used at many different uh, points in our program. So, you will be uh, duplicating the information in, in, in context that you might not even need those uh, that information there. Oh, okay. Okay. So you just a single table kind of centralizes and put all the identifiers in one place. Good question. Okay. So using the same idea here, but with an expression. And let's assume that there are only two possible types here, integer and float, just to make it easier. So the semantic rules is just, uh, the semantic rule is going to be used to assign a type for an expression. If the two variables, and you, an expression is very simple here, it's just an addition of two variables. If ha they have the same type, I'm going to assume that the type is uh, the common type. If they have different types, let's use the most generic type, which would be float. So let's try to evaluate this more complex example. You have an assignment. This is your parse tree. You have a variable A on the left side, and you have an expression on the right side. This expression is an addition of two variables B and C. So using that semantic rule number four, you're going to perform a bunch of lookups to figure it out what are the types associated with those variables. Because what we need to do is figure out the type of this expression to see if this type on the right side of the assignment is compatible with the variable on the left side and the variable on the left side is an int. So the expression must be an int. If the expression type is a float, then you have a semantic error. Okay. And because of semantic rule, forgot the number, I think it will tell us. Uh, rule number two, because you have float and int, the expression's type is going to be float because it's the most generic one. And then we will have a semantic rule failing because you can't go float to int. Fail semantic rule number one. Okay, so this is just a small <laughs> uh, glimpse of uh, of the complexity associated with semantic and analysis. Okay, uh, and that's as far as we're gonna go. Okay, um, it's a fascinating topic, but uh, we also have other things uh, to talk about. But I just wanted to give you a bit of an introduction of semantic analysis and, and this uh, example that we're using is super simple, right? The, we just have very simple expressions. Imagine now uh, more complex expressions, right? How to compute these types and figure out the type of an expression. Uh, for example, when you have function calls in an expression that adds more complexity, right? You have to check type returned by the, the, the function. So 
uh, things can uh, really, um, the complexity can eat easily add up, okay? But we're not gonna go deeper than this. I just wanted to give you a uh, really short introduction of this, this topic, okay? If you're more curious about that, you can check uh, the code for the interpreter. Uh, it's this programming language, uh, mouse, doesn't have a lot of semantic rules, but there are a few, um, and you guys can check that in the interpreter. Okay. And also waiting for you guys to uh, submit the programming assignment so we can talk about it in class a little bit about the code behind uh, use for the interpreter. We can talk about that next week. Okay. All right, uh, so let's uh, move on and we're going to start functional programming today. So functional programming uh, emphasizes the use of functions in their applications uh, rather than commands in their execution. Uh, the, the concept of functions and modularization in general, it's embedded in most pretty much all programming languages. But when we talk functional programming, uh, we need to understand that the concept of functions is more like the, the concept from math. Uh, they are more, uh, more in the sense of definitions. Uh, and pretty much you can, if you carry this concept um, further, uh, you pretty much can define anything using functions, including, including numbers, right? We're going to see an example where we're going to define numbers using functions, okay? Just to, to introduce function programming properly. So programming in a functional language uh, consists of building definitions and using the computer to evaluate expressions. Okay. Uh, so an expression is used to describe or denote a value. So let's see some examples here. We have uh, X uh, is five. Okay, so that's a definition. Then you have y is 3. It's another definition. And when you write x plus y, you have an expression that evaluates to a. So that's pretty obvious. Um, what is different here is that uh, how, you, how you read this, right? Because Outside functional programming, you will say, okay, uh, we're going to assign 5 to x. Currently, x is 5, right? And y has the value of 3. But for the functional programming, the, the, how, you, how you read that is slightly different. It's like x is 5, right? And... Uh, that thing is a definition saying that x is 5. So you don't read this, 5 is assigned to x. You just you read as a definition how x is defined. In that sense, uh, 
x plus y will always be evaluated as a because x is always going to be 5, y is always going to be 3. So you're saying that you can't reassign these values? No, that's a definition, okay? So uh, functional programming's origins can be tracked to uh, lambda calculus. So today, uh, basically, we're going to do lambda calculus a little bit. Uh, it's a mathematical theory of functions developed by Alonzo Church in the 30s. Okay, so that's. Uh, Way before right, uh, digital computers were uh, created, but the theory for uh, functions uh, for this type of using functions to perform computation, this was defined uh, really early. And we can say that lambda calculus is a simple yet powerful programming language. Okay? Comparable to uh, Turing machines, for example. And this is the grammar for lambda calculus. BNF. Okay? So you can have uh, expressions, can be variables, can be a function, or can be an application. Uh, or can be an expression uh, inside parentheses. A variable is just an identifier or a literal. A function uh, can be, a function is defined using the symbol lambda, and then one or more variables, need at least one, and then the dots and some expression. So the fact that an expression can be a function uh, allows us to have functions here, right? So functions can be defined using functions too. And what does that mean? Uh, so how do you read this function here, right? Uh, this definition of a function. You can read, and I'm going to try to compare that to what we are, you guys are familiar with, right? Uh, these are parameters, okay? So these are parameters. Dot separates the parameters to the function's definition. So this expression here is the definition of the function, okay? The actual code, let's put it this way, okay? Uh, an application is two expressions. So you can have uh, in, uh, in fact, you can have um, an expression being an application. Let's look at an example here. This is how a simple uh, Basically, this is an application for lambda calculus because an application is two expressions, right? So you have one expression here, okay? And you have another expression, okay? And this is res the, the result of this application, okay? So this application is very simple. It has a function. So this expression is a function. It looks like a function, right? Lambda, a one parameter. And this is the implementation. And this is what? What do you think this is? It's the it's the argument, right? It's the value that's going to be passed to this function. Okay. So this is what's going to happen when this application, right? <laughs> I I really need your abstraction capabilities today to the highest level. Okay. <laughs> So this looks like an application. I'm calling this function, passing the argument phi. So how is this uh, uh, how is this going to be evaluated to five? So five 
is going to use to define x, right? And then the implementation is x. So x is returned. Okay? So if you think of, like, this is the argument, this is the parameter, and this is the implementation, which just returns x. Okay? It, it looks very uh, simple, right? Uh, but don't you agree that this is like a program? It's simple. It's a simple program. But can you imagine someone before computers, right? As we know today, creating those things, right? All the mechanisms that we use today, it's already there, right? And all using math. So types of variables. So you can have so the variables preceded by lambda, kind of like the, the parameters, right? They are called the bound variables. Non-bound variables are said to be free variables. So uh, this guy here, right? It's, it's a bound variable because it's right after the lambda. And this is a free variable, for example. Okay, function equivalence. So all these functions, if, if two functions only differ by their bound variables, they are said to be equivalent. Okay. Um, so this is also considered to be bound variable, okay? It's also preceded by a length. This one is free. So uh, if we look at these functions here, basically we're just saying that these functions are all the same, okay? Because the only difference are the symbol we use for the variables, right? X, X, Y, 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 Z, Z. So these are all equivalents. This is called the alpha reduction. Now well, let's talk about uh, how would you define functions with more than one, uh, having more than one argument. Like for example, look at this other function here. You have a function uh, taking two uh, parameters and it's just going to return those parameters. Again, these functions are very simple in the beginning. We're going to see other applications, but basically uh, two is going to be copied as the, as the argument, and this is um, the, the order is important, right? So if two is is the first argument, so it goes to a, and three is the second, goes to the second parameter here. So a is two, b is three, and two three is returned. We can also look at uh, functions with more than one argument this way. And this is called the currying notation. So currying notation is something that functional programming languages use uh, a lot. So it's, it's best to get familiarized with currying notation. You're going to see that in, in Scala. We're going to see that in Haskell see those examples so get yourself familiar familiarized with current notation so current notation is basically saying that uh, you have the, uh, in current notation each function takes only always one parameter okay? it's defined it's take, takes only one argument okay so it's defined with one, one only one parameter so the implementation for this first parameter that takes one argument is a function that takes the second argument. Okay, and this is how we we and and at the end you get the same thing, but the, the notation is slightly different. And and this is done to make it uh, even simpler and more atomic the way you evaluate functions, okay? Because instead of having to deal with, oh, this function takes one, this function takes two, this function takes three, 
it doesn't matter because the functions will consume only one parameter at a time. Okay, so the first step evaluating this whole function call here is to get just one argument. Number two will be replaced here, right? Uh, and A is two. So the implementation of this first function is a function that takes B, the second parameter, and the implementation is 2B, right? And then we're going to consume the second parameter. So B is now 3, right? B is 3. And the result is 2 because we already had 2, right? And B is 3. So 2, 3. I know you may be thinking, oh, that's the same thing. What's the big deal? It has a slightly different uh, interpretation here because instead of having this function taking two, we actually created, so instead of having one function consuming two values, now we have two functions consuming one value at a time. Okay? So applications are assumed to be left associative. So when you evaluate, we always evaluate from left to right. So that's that's what I was explaining. Uh, we're going to consume two first. So the implementation of this whole function here means that this is the output, right, of this first function here, right? And the implementation, we just need to replace all the occurrence of A with two. Right, so we end up having lambda b instead of a, we replace a by 2, right, and then b. And this is the function we have now to consume 3. So 3 is, so b is 3, and the implementation is 2, and we're going to replace b by 3. So 2, 3. Right? How are we doing? Too good? Okay, so now I actually, that's the moment where I really need your abstraction. Because what we're going to do now, we're going to just show how to represent numbers using functions. Okay, so it's like we're extrapolating this thing about functions, and we're just going to show that functions can be used to anything, including represent the natural numbers. Okay? Let's let's try this. Uh, we're gonna say that the number is zero, okay, is gonna be represented by this function here. Okay. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Just keep in mind that this is how we're gonna do. It, okay, but there is a logic, and we, I'm gonna prove that this this works. Okay, so. The number zero is going to be represented by this function. Number one is this one here. You see that it's slightly different. The implementation is slightly different, right? Number two is going to be the same uh, parameters here, but the implementation has an extra s and so on. Okay? Those are functions to represent those numbers. And then. <laughs> We're going to use a function uh, called successor. So the successor function is if I call this function passing zero, this function should return one. Okay? So if I call this function passing one, this function should return two. That's the successor function. The successor function is fundamental in math. Uh, to represent sets, right? I can represent the natural numbers saying that, look, the first number is this one, and to get the next one, here's the, the construction to get the successor, the next number. And just by using these two definitions, basically we're representing the, the natural numbers, right? And this is what we're trying to do. 
And uh, let's let me show you that that using this successor function, we're gonna go from zero to one. Okay, so let's let's do this together. So this is the successor function, and I'm applying using application passing this guy here is what you remember this is zero right this is the function that represents zero okay so how can we apply this it's number zero which is the function that represents zero to this function successor here right well what is the first symbol you're seeing here W, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to consume this whole parameter here, okay? And I'm going to get rid of W, and I'm going to replace on the implementation side, I'm going to replace W by this function here, this representation of zero. So the implementation, the calling this function passing zero, I replace W, what is left is Y and X, and on this side here, I'm going to have Y. Instead of W, I'm going to replace by Z, by the zero, right? This function here. And what is left is YZ. Okay? You understand going from this first step to the second? Now from here to here. Okay, now what we have here. We have a YZ, right? Pass to this function here. So let's apply this function to uh, this function zero. Okay? So look at this. This counts as one parameter. Okay? So I'm going to replace S. Okay, I'm going to consume S. And on the right side, I don't see S. So the output of this function doesn't uh, care about, uh, so I'm, I'm consuming y, okay? So when I consume y, because s is the parameter, right? But it's not in the implementation, right? So s just disappeared, okay? So s is the value y, right? But the implementation says return z. Right, so we replace S, we have Z, and that's why we just repeat Z, and the value of Y just disappeared. Do you guys see that? It's too abstract. If I have a function like I can't imagine that people online understanding this. <laughs> Okay, so we said four. We said four. We said two, no. We said three. It only works there, right? If I remember right. What's going on with the focus? Okay. Maybe if you press the black button under the board, it might focus on that board. Here? Like, uh, the boards, underneath the boards, uh, like the whiteboards, they have oh. a black button. So, so that's what those are for, right? Yeah, that's right. So let's. There, you can see it. It's horrible. Uh, I think you can. Get you a tablet. So, so I'm just going to copy everything so we can do W Y X dot Y W Y X. And we're going to call this function S E zero, which is S. Z dot C. Okay? 
So let's see what's going to happen here. I'm going to use different colors. Everything is going to be so simple. So this guy here, okay, is the argument for this parameter here. Okay, so I'm going to say that W is this whole thing. Okay, when you have a function like this is how you implement a how you call a function. So if I have, for example, a dot, uh, I don't know, um, a, b, and let's say I call this function using chu, okay? So chu is passed to a, and the implementation is, I'm just gonna replace a with chu, because a is chu, and whatever is left, I repeat, all right? This is how you call a function, a function of programming, specific lambda columns. Okay. What happens if I don't have a in the implementation? Just get b. You just just get b, right? And you may think, oh, but the the number two disappeared. Well, the number two was passed to a, but I didn't use a in the implementation, so that's why you end up with b. Okay. So let's do this. W disappears, right? Y and X, and I'm going to replace W with what W is. So Y, and then S, C, dot Z, and then I repeat Y and X. Okay? So now I'm going to look at this part here. Okay? I have a S here, and I'm going to try to consume this, per this value here. So S is Y, okay? So I'm going to repeat this. I consume S, so what is left is Z, right? And because on the right side here, I don't have S, I just repeat Z, okay? And I was able to consume this value here. And that's what we had at that point. Now I'm gonna do this again, right? Just add this parenthesis wrong here. So now I have zz, that function in x. So I'm just going to call this function here, x, as z is x. And the implementation is just return x, right? Because z is x. So this whole thing, we still have y, right? And then x. Okay, so using uh, function equivalence, this is number one, right? Because we can replace by, if you want to use the same symbols you're using, S, C, dot, uh, S, and X, right? No, Z, right? Uh, S, X. I should use the same symbols for S, S, Z. Okay? So we were able to go from 0 to 1, basically. All of that just to say that 1 comes after 0. <laughs> Maybe we were just lucky. Let's see if this successor of 1 is 2. Okay, so we're applying the successor function. All right? Passing one. So let's see what's going to happen. W is removed, and we're going to replace this W here with all of this. That's what we have here. Y, this is W, and then YX. Okay? Now I'm going to look on this side here. I'm going to replace S by Y. But I, the replacement is always only on the right side. On the left side here, I'm consuming S, 
because I'm calling this function, right? So y s goes away here because I consume only one symbol. And then instead of s, I'm going to replace with y. I still have x here. So let's apply x. Z is x, right? So I end up having y x, right? Y x. This y here is this y here. So what is this? Number two. We went from number one to number two. Excited? Or exciting? Now it's your turn. Get a piece of paper and see if you can go. Uh, this is actually two to one, right? Yeah, so see if we can go from two to one. I need to update this. Actually, two to one. Computation when you're doing Turing machine, this must be a piece of tape. <laughs> yeah. But I, I would yeah. argue that lambda calculus is higher in abstraction level than the Turing machine. Because later on, we're going to see if else with lambda calculus. You guys save for these TVs. Right? Yeah, so you might as well use them, right? Have to use it. Yeah, take it home. <laughs> 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 Keep my money back. So I can't watch that. Do you hear that? Yeah, exactly. It's all. Yeah, let's use more. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Sir, my wife, my poor sir. Very well, and that says dot y. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, you do. You shouldn't be using your good spark to be good. What happens after this part? Yeah, so this is the idea. I know. Of course. I just swung in the names. That's what I did. I replaced this. This one has a good W. We've turned W. And then now we're in here. So that's what I think when I go to the top. Oh, man. It just disappeared here. 
I have a question. There's no more friends there, right? Oh, 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 you notice how like, like this is like the right thing we are consuming yeah. so yeah. so we're, we're saying I, this function is saying I'm going to correct that slide the next evaluate the function takes S and C and returns S S C with C R Y Y so here, we do that tells the number, right? So that's the Yeah, it consumes one Now this is consumed, so now this is like just a Z. I just have, I just have to put the This function is not right? Not yet. So I still have a lambda Z? Yep, you have a lambda Z, and it's going to return. It's gonna have yeah, yeah, my both, y no, my y z, yeah, right? Yep. Let's do sub pass x to that. X is gonna be speed. You got three. Yeah. You got dots. Dots are on board. There. That's right. Yeah. You're just gonna keep doing this until 100. <laughs> <laughs> I need more flipping powers. Yes, that's why I'm on. Okay, so let's see if this makes sense. Wait, is it done? Uh, yeah, all of this no, it's, it's is W. We replace W here. Now we're going to consume oh, Y. S goes away. S will be replaced by Y. And now we're consuming X. So we end up with Y, Y, X. Y, Y, X. As you can see, this is the equivalent of we just end up with this. three. We got that. Right? So it works. Okay, so we figured out these examples uh, show that we can use functions to represent numbers, and those numbers uh, can be. Uh, put in an order because they are in an order because using the successor function we we're able to go from one representation of a number to the next one in the natural order. Okay, how would you implement addition? Okay. Well, basically, uh, you just need to apply the successor uh, a number of times, right? If I want to do 2 plus 3, I just need to get the successor of 3 two times, right? If I have successor of 3 one time, that's 4, another time is 5. So you just need to apply the successor function in number of times, you get addition. Uh, multiplication can be defined in terms of addition, right? Because if I want to multiply 2 by 3, I just need to call addition, right? Like uh, 2 times, like 2 times 3, you just need to add 3 2 times. So this is just to show you that once you define uh, very basic functions like the successor. From the successor, you define addition, right? And from addition, you can define the multiplication, and you start building on top of the functions you have. So now let's look at true and true and false. That's going to be important to define conditional functions, right? Because condition is based on Boolean expressions. Remember, this was all done in the 30s. Can you imagine? 
Why? What was the application for this at the time? Thinking about computation. Computational theory came before the digital machines were actually implemented. So, as we did uh, when we defined zero and one and the numbers, we're going to use this convention here. Uh, true is going to be this function. And false is going to be this one. So the true function, uh, whatever is the number we're taking, uh, it shows that number, right? And the y, the, the false, uh, just get rid of that argument, right? Because it doesn't appear. We don't have x on the right side yet on the implementation, right? So simple mechanism to define true and false. So uh, those functions will define basic uh, logical uh, operations like and, or, and not. Okay, so let's uh, check if this is correct. Let's just do <laughs> true and true. So basically, we're showing that these functions, these and functions using the definitions of true and false, they actually work. So we need to use the truth table here. So let's start with true and true. So this is true. Right, and this is also true. I'm just using different symbols so we don't get confused. More than we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to consume the first argument first. So this is the first one is going to be consumed as x. Okay, so x disappeared, and x here is going to be replaced by first argument. We repeat y and we repeat this part here. Okay, so this is just to consume the first argument. Now let's compute the second one. The second one is y. We're going to consume this. Y disappear, and then we have we're going to we need to replace y by this whole thing here. So we repeat this guy here. Y is going to be replaced by the argument, and then we repeat the other. Okay, so this is what we have at this point. Now, uh, we're going to consume this here as A. So A goes away, A is replaced by... Actually, no, uh, we're going from left to right, sorry. So we're actually consuming this. This is the argument for this function here. So A goes away, we still have to keep B, and A is replaced by this whole thing. Now we can consume this guy here. So B is this guy here, and we don't have B in the implementation, right? You don't see B in the implementation, it means what? You just get, you just repeat the implementation, and this is true. You have you see C going to C, so that's true. So we just said that true equals true and true is true. Can you repeat that last We're consuming this argument as B. So because we don't have B on this side, we just repeat the implementation. Oh, okay. Just like we did here, when we were consuming a, but we don't have A here, we just repeat. Oh. So the order of operations is to take like the outermost function that still has unused arguments and apply the leftmost uh, parameter. parameter to that? Okay, yeah. True and false. Let's do true and false. X is consumed, so we're going to replace X by this guy. There it is, X, and then Y repeats. Uh, and now we're going to consume this guy as Y, so we repeat this. 
y becomes this whole thing and we repeat this and now we're going to consume this guy as a so b replace this the output is a this is why this is repeated here and we just repeat u b b here and now we need to apply this to this function now wait a minute we apply all this to this function here but you don't see b on this side that's why we end up with cbd and this is false okay so when when the first one appears on the right side that's true when the second one appears on the right side the second one appears on the right side that's false so that's correct False and true. Remember, this is false because the second one is appearing. This is true because the first one is appearing. And uh, we do that, consume x. Make sure you understand, because I think you're going to do false and false. So this first one replaces x. So we have x and y and v. Now we're going to replace y, right? This guy here. And then I guess we're going to apply this to a. But because a is not there, we just repeat. So we have v, b. And then this guy here, just apply to b. We just show b, and b is all this because the second one is up here on the right side, that's false. So make sure you understand and now do false and false. You need some time to try false and false. I don't want to have all the fun. I want to share the fun. <laughs> 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 Expression for false and the expression for zero are the same thing, right? Or equivalent? Yeah, or whatever that thing is called. I think so, yeah. It, it's the one Z uh, or zero is S Z dot S Z dot S. Dot Z, dot Z. Z. Dot Z. Yeah. So that's false. Yeah. And that makes sense, right? That zero, false being false, zero. Yeah.
<laughs> okay, so the first is consumed as X, place X, and then we're going to consume the second one as Y, so Y is replaced here. Then we're going to consume this guy as A, but A is not appearing, so that's why we have BB. Now, this is almost like the, it's the identity, right? Whatever you plug in, that's what you got. That's what you get, right? And we can end up having UBP. Second one repeats, so that's the false one. Okay. Oh, that's for the or. I'm not going to do all of those. Uh, but this is showing that true or two is true. And I'm going to laugh as a practice. <laughs> Maybe I should give this a home. Yes. I see that. <laughs> I, when, when I see things that are in uh, like a three enumeration, immediately I think three points home. <laughs> That's three points home. Oh, but I have an answer. No, that's not true. Okay, all right. So I don't have an answer. Well, I will assign this as a nice homework for you. Not true is false. This is, let's do this very quick. The good thing about the, the lecture on lambda, lambda calculus is usually I give my students a break and we, go, we finish earlier. So today we have something good, we're going to finish yeah. earlier. That you can't do too much abstraction, it, it can damage your, your brain, right? <laughs> <laughs> or at least I don't think we can take a lot in just one scoop. Okay, so uh, not true is false. Okay, let's see this. Um, this is true, right? Because you see Z is the first one appearing on the other side, so that's true. And we're going to apply it as x. This is the function that uh, that defines not. So let's see if that really happens. So x is replaced. Uh, yeah, so x replaced here because it was replaced in the beginning. That's why it's kind of confusing. 
But you see here is ZWZ, and then we have this YUBB, and then Y uh, lambda ABB. All okay. right. So now we're gonna replace Z by this function. So Z disappears. We keep W and replace Z. So this is what we have. And now we're going to replace W by all of this. But look at this. W doesn't appear in the function's implementation or definition. So that's why we end up with lambda UVB. And the second one is appearing on the implementation, so that's false. So we proved that not true is false. Now let's do, how about you guys try that? Not false is true. I think it's the last pregnancy. Oh Not false is true. <laughs> the good thing is that after lambda calculus, you're going to think that Haskell is a piece of cake. <laughs> It's funny because uh, a WS has maybe the function that has nothing to do with that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I hear the word all the time, but that doesn't mean the same thing. No. It's uh, more like uh, anonymous function, this kind of synonym. Did you guys get this? The first one is false. The yeah. Uh, okay. uh, 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 lambda. Not uh, say exactly uh, which lambda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not my fault. <laughs> it is the same thing. Then the next one, the you'll have all lamb. Did you get that twice though? No, you'll have lamb W still. Or you can say something like, I, yeah. I know the WS. And we just dropped the middle. Right? Right? Yes. That name that I also you didn't hear. Yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> yeah, so we do drop. So we have, yeah, it's like, well, it's lamb W. Just different. Yeah. 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 A, B, not A. And the first one's on the right, so that's true. A, which is true. Yeah, so, so W turns into so it's the right. And so we just dropped it. Yeah, and then you get lamb. So you get lamb W dot W, right? And then you get lamb. So you just get AC dot there's nothing around for the 30s. Oh, and then you get lambda a b dot a, and then that's true, right? Okay. okay. Let's just check. X is replaced. The right side, so this whole thing goes here, and then we repeat this whole part. And now we're applying this guy as an argument for Z, basically Z, but Z is not in the implementation. But we only consume Z, so W, this parameter stays, and we also see W, because this whole thing gets uh, consumed and it's not being displayed in the output here of the function. And now, this is the identity. We just need to repeat. And because 
the first one is appearing, that means this is true. So it worked. Now, this is the cool thing. Conditional tests. Okay? So basically, this is saying this whole function there. I don't know how he came up with that function. But the idea is that this function consumes C. And if C is true, it's A. If C is false, it's B. Isn't that amazing? It's pretty wild. Pretty wild, and it works. Let's see. <laughs> okay, and we're A and B can be anything, can be functions, but I'm not just gonna just gonna use A and B as symbols, but they can be anything. Okay, it doesn't matter. Oh, so that's false again. And for the condition, what is this? Is this true or false? True, right? So what I am arguing is that this function should return A. So let's see if that really happens. All right, so this first part needs to be consumed. We have X and we repeat, right? Dot Y, uh, lambda Y dot lambda z and then this x is replaced by a b a okay and then y z we just consume c that is true and now we have a and b so let's consume a i see y and i see y here so let's repeat c a b a instead of y i replace with a and then C. Now let's consume B. So it's just one parameter, so it gets rid of it, of it. And whenever I see a Z, I'm going to replace it with a B. So A, B, A. We had that big A, and then Z is replaced by B. That's what we have. Let's consume A now. A is consumed. We repeat B. And instead of this A, we see big A. Now let's consume B. Look at that. It doesn't matter because the result is A. Move on. Maybe we were lucky. <laughs> So let's try with false, because now we need to get B, right? So let's practice. See if you can get B. And do you agree that this is false? Yes. The second symbol is repeated. So prove that this is going to lead to B. B, B. Maybe next semester I should ask the students to do a lambda calculus and service. <laughs> <laughs> the grammar is super simple, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the 
the actual implementation for a machine, for a program, that's easy too. So it's not complicated. It sounds complicated, but it's not. Instead of mouse. You get B? So this guy here is false. Replacing X. So we repeat lambda Y, lambda Z. X is replaced by ABB, and then we repeat YZ. Now we're going to consume A, replace Y, all the occurrence of Y, which is just this one, is replaced by A. Now we're going to consume B as Z, Re uh, repeat A, B, B. A is repeated, and then C is now B. Now we're going to consume A. If A is little a, but it doesn't appear in the implementation. So the result of that is BB, identity, consuming B gives us B. Go on. Well, I stopped here. Uh, I was going to do while loops, but <laughs> I think it was too much. All right, guys, we're finishing earlier. Uh, thanks for staying with me. And uh, we'll start more hands-on functional programming on Tuesday. We can, I will assign that three or this whole work, okay? Yeah, <laughs> you